The Energy Resource Institute, Terry, Indofrin Center for Promotion of Advanced Research, CEFIPRA, and India Habitat Center, New Delhi. This TIP forum has been founded with the objective uh, of promoting informed deb debate on various aspects of science, technology, and innovation policy. Uh, keeping this in mind, a monthly lecture uh, series is being organized to bridge the gap between science and uh, society by disseminating information on developments in science and technology. Today, Vigyan Prasar is organizing the 42nd lecture in this series. And uh, Vigyan Prasar is an autonomous organization of the Department of Science and Technology, uh, which is actively engaged in large-scale science communication, popularization, and its extension activities for the last 32 years. I feel immense pleasure to welcome the distinguished speaker of today's session, Dr. K. Sridhar, Director, Neuroscience and Spine, MGM Healthcare, Chennai, and Honorary Secretary, Neuro Neurological Society of India. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome all the senior scientists and consultants uh, of our partner institutions who has joined us for the session today. Uh, also a very warm welcome to all the attendees who have joined us for the event. There are several disorders of the brain and the nervous system and understanding how to prevent and treat these disorders, diseases is crucial for maintaining the overall health and well-being of all people. Thus, there is a need to work together to educate the public about their, the, their brains and the neurological sciences. Today's topic of lecture is rewiring the brain. Is it possible? Rewiring of the brain and the nervous system works by removing bad connections, establishing new connections, and reforming connections. This ability to rewire the brain is also called neuroplasticity. To shed more light on the neuroplasticity today, we have with us Dr. Krish Sridhar, who will give examples of how rewiring is possible in the scenarios of epilepsy, stroke, head injury, as well as problems like Parkinson's disease and dementia. So without taking much time to proceed the program further, I invite my colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Abhinav Singh, to introduce the speaker, Dr. Chris Sridhar. And I would like to say that uh, Dr. Nafi Purasha, Director Vigyan Prasar, who is supposed to chair the today's session, is in an urgent meeting, and they will not be able to join this program uh, as of now. And he has sent his apology, sir. So uh, I request my colleague, Sri Abhinav, to introduce you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good Abhinav. afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yeah. Ji, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Sridhar sir, and all the esteemed guests present here. Although uh, K. Sridhar's surname needs no introduction, he is renowned neurosurgeon with over 30 years of experience in neurosurgery, trained under pioneer neurosurgeon professor B. Ramamurthy. Dr. Sridhar has established centers of excellence in neurosciences centered around the concept of integrated neurocare. His experience and expertise in spine surgery, brain tumor, and vascular surgery, as well as in the pediatric problems, is well known. He has done pioneering work in micro neurosurgery and especially in brain stem. I would like to tell, using his expertise, he developed two well known innovations Sridhar spinal retractor system and occipito cervical plate screw wire construct. He has been bestowed with many nationally acclaimed awards and recognitions, such as Professor Rajara Thinam Oration Award, Healthcare Warrior Award, Professor Dayananda Rao Oration, and several other medals and awards to name some. He has published numerous books, book chapters, and papers in peer-reviewed national and international journals. Today, he is among us to throw more light on the rewiring the brain. Uh, welcome, sir. Sridhar, sir. Thank you. Uh, can we start the presentation? Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I would really like to thank uh, the director of uh, Vigyan Prasar, Dr. Nakul, and uh, Dr. Kinkini Das Gupta Mishra and her team who have uh, invited me uh, so nicely to give this RIS STIP award, uh, sorry, lecture uh, today. And uh, uh, 
because it is very important that we understand what the brain does and how we can uh, improve what the brain does. Next slide, please. So over 30 years of experience, what I have learned is that there is a lot more to the brain that we actually know. And however, there is a lot more also that we can do with the brain. And this is very important to understand. And we need to keep updating ourselves on what is possible to do for any pathology in the brain and how to also prevent problems of the brain. Next, please. It's a wondrous organ. And uh, it is something which we are learning about every day. Next, please. As you all know, the brain is situated inside the skull. And it's protected by a very thick skull bone. And actually, the, it is many people think that the brain is only at the top of the head, but it is not. It is actually anything above the nose, behind, above and behind the nose and the eyes is the brain. And therefore, all these uh, structures which are there behind the eyes and the nose are very, very important because that is where is the core of your nervous system. Next, please. Now, one must understand that the brain controls all the functions of our limbs and all organs of the body. Uh, every single part of your body, be it the sensation at the tips of your fingers, be it the, the heart rate, be it the way you breathe, everything is controlled by the brain. Next, please. Now, just a bit about how the brain is exactly composed. If you look at this, the, the cell body of the brain, of the brain cells, these are called neurons, and they let out uh, processes called uh, axons, which then communicate with the neighboring uh, cell bodies or neurons, or they could even communicate with uh, muscles or other end organs. Now, the way they are constructed is very similar to electrical wires. For example, if you look at this, uh, this colorful diagram here, you will see that the orange colored nerve fiber, is, which is the axon, that is the actual nerve fiber. But around that fiber is uh, what you call uh, the myelination sheath, which is the insulation uh, for your uh, axon. Now, it is very similar to the, nerve, to the electrical wires with the copper uh, wire inside which is actually conducts the electricity has a plastic surrounding which is the insulation and that is how very similar to electrical wires our nerves also are insulation around them next please so if you look at not only the single nerve but each of these nerves are bundled together with other nerves to form nerve fibers and all of them are bundled together to form nerve tracts. Now, similar, very similar to the high uh, uh, tension wires that you see, which come from transformers and give uh, give uh, electrical supply to our buildings. So even there, all these nerve fibers are bundled together and and bring the uh, bring the information to the body. Similarly, the electrical wires and cables which bring electricity and light to our house are also have the same sort of structure. Next. But more interesting than just the electrical wires is that the brain, the way the brain functions is a unique combination of electrical and chemical energy. We all know that the, the way the uh, nerve cell transmits information is through an electrical signal this is uh, goes through the, a, a sodium potassium gated channels and it creates a, a potential which is in microvolts and this channel uh, moves through the entire nerve fiber which is the axon and comes to the end of it where it this nerve uh, these nerve stimulations uh, these electrical signals get transformed into chemical signals by releasing chemicals in the nerve ending now, these chemicals then are released in the cavity between the next nerve and the first nerve. And then they again stimulate an electrical impulse onto the next nerve. So it is very, very important to understand that 
this is the only perhaps organ where you have a such a well defined combination and working together of electrical and chemical energy and both are so important that one cannot do without the other next please it is not only the nerve cell which is the neuron or its process which is the axon which is important very very important for the nerve cell and the axon to work are the supporting cells which are called the neuroglia now these are different types these may be called astrocytes these may be called oligodendrocytes they are ependymal cells they are a microglia each with different functions but very very important is the fact that if you have a problem with any of these support cells then you have a problem with the brain function as well and therefore the support structures are equally important as important as the neuron itself next please so what we now know is that the neurons don't work in isolation you have groups of neurons which come together they work as a group and communicate with other groups for, which create networks next please now if you look at the electron microscopy structure of a part of the brain it may look like a maze of a tangle of wires which you can often see on roads or uh, when you look at the the computer wires in a in a huge server this is how it may seem next please but through all that chaos there is uh, some order in it and because all these uh, fibers are are come together as nerve fiber tracts and these tracts are what communicate actually from one part of the brain to the other and luckily for us now with technology we are in mris able to see uh, in the mr tractography for example in this 3 tesla machine mri you can actually see the nerve fiber tract both in normal and in disease states and therefore these often help in diagnosis as well so you can actually then now see these tracts in different parts of the brain next please so basically if you look at the uh, look at the way the nerve cell and the brain is and compare it to the solar system the nerve cell is the uh, is the solar system which we have as we know it the the groups of cells or the networks form the 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 milky way or the core networks and the universe is equal to the brain therefore each one is an integral part of the other and each one forms a unit uh, which then part forms a part of the other but each one works in its own sphere next please we all have been thinking for a long time that uh, different parts of the brain have isolated different functions for example we thought that the motor cortex is what is responsible ultimately for motor movement the sensory cortex for sensations the frontal lobe has its own thinking power is the temporal lobe for memory etc etc and we thought that these were all in isolation therefore we thought that if you had to have a motor movement you had to only have the motor cortex which is important and nothing else is important next but now we know that this is not very true we now know that when there is a particular function to happen different parts of the brain are involved and therefore it is not only one part of the brain but there are different parts of the brain involved to create that particular function next please and therefore when you look at this when there is an emotion you have different parts of the brain firing and you have these parts which are involved in the in the pathway of emotion they are network of which are involved in emotion so also speech when i am making a speech to you it is not only the speech area which we know is the broca's area or the speech reception area which is the wernicke's area but it is also different other parts of the brain which process information and bring the information to these areas which are therefore make the speech a, a good communicative device otherwise speech will only be garbled it will only be different words spoken and perhaps not spoken at all and including when you have numbers processing if we have to do mental maths now what are the areas involved it is not only a single area but multiple areas which then information goes back and forth and there is a lot of assimilation of, of data which then comes out as mental maths therefore this is something which one must remember 
that what we thought sometimes were not very important parts of the brain are now found to be as important as other parts of the brain. Next, please. So now we have identified there are three basic core networks in the brain. And these core networks define the way the person is, define the way that the person uh, does their acts, defines their memory, defines their general intelligence. And this is how the person is. So if there is any problem with any of these networks, there is a complete change of personality. There is a complete change in the person's behavior as well. Next, please. One other very important fact that one has to know and remember is, like I said, it is important to have the supportive structures of the brain equally important. So also is the blood supply to the brain. You may all know that the brain weighs about 1.5 kilograms in a, in a normal adult. It's about 2% of the total body weight. But the brain gets about 15% of the complete cardiac output, which means 15% of the blood which goes out from the heart goes to the brain. And the brain also utilizes almost 20% of the body's oxygen at any point of time. This is very, very important because the brain itself cannot store any nutrition. It cannot store any substrates of nutrition and therefore relies all the time on continuously getting both oxygen and blood. Next, please. So what happens is that you have a two percent body weight structure which needs so much of, of input. And therefore, we understand it's a highly metabolically active structure which cannot do without uh, 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 blood and oxygen and nutrients every second. Next, please. Therefore, when there is no blood flow to the brain, what happens? In 15 seconds, there is a loss of consciousness. In one minute, brainstem stops functioning, which means that there is no active functioning of the brain. In four to five minutes, all the substrates of, of energy start getting depleted. And by six minutes, there is irreversible damage. So that is how fast things happen when there is no flow. And this, therefore, one must understand that that is how much the brain is dependent on something as simple as a good blood pressure. Next, please. It is almost akin to the uh, to the uh, nuclear ret uh, retractors. I'm taking the example of the Fukushima retractor, which was affected in the tsunami of 2006. We in Chennai were affected by that tsunami as well. But coming back to the nuclear reactor, you have a reactor core, which is the actual radioactive, where all the, the fission and the fusion happens. But what is very, very important for that to function well are all the support systems. You have the suppression pool, you have the other pools, you, you have a huge support structure around it, which are equally important. And those are what got damaged in the tsunami and not the core. And when that got damaged, there was a problem. And therefore, just like that, the support system of the brain is as important as the brain itself or the nerve cells itself. And we have to make sure that that is absolutely fine. Next, please. Therefore, it is very important when we talk about rewiring of the brain that we also look at remodeling and restructuring the support systems of the brain and the spinal cord. Next, please. So coming to the topic, can we rewire the brain? Now, what do you mean by rewiring the brain? So by rewiring the brain, it means reestablishing lost connections. You need to enable new connections in the brain and remove all the bad connections. So you must remember what I said earlier, that the brain works by networks, by communication, by connections. It's connections between different groups of nerve cells between each other, each one communicating with the other in different ways. And when you start enabling new connections, re-establishing lost connections, and the brain has this capability, we now know to do this, and this is what is called neuroplasticity. Next, please. So neuroplasticity uh, can be uh, brain's ability to change and adapt, which means that it is not that the brain is fixed in its working. It's a dynamic structure. And therefore, the brain has the capability to change and adapt. 
both structurally and functionally. But what one has to do is to create the new connections, re-establish old connections and remove the bad connections so that the brain functions can move from a damaged area to an undamaged area or the brain function can, you can keep it going for a very long time. Next, please. So I'm going to start by giving examples of how we do rewiring in different pathologies. Uh, we'll touch upon each of these. The first one, of course, is epilepsy, which is basically a hyperactivity of the brain. Now, why do I say that? Basically, like what, what I spoke to you about, the structure of the brain being very, very similar to the, to the electrical cables. Imagine if the electrical cables did not have any insulin there would be short circuiting and sparking, which would affect the whole wiring of the entire building. Similarly, if there is uh, uncontrolled uh, activity, electrical activity or neural activity and impulses which travel from one part of the brain, they travel uncontrolled to places they should not travel. That is what is epilepsy. And therefore, epilepsy is uncontrolled hyperactivity of the brain. Next, please. Though epilepsy has social stigma to it, we now know that a lot of famous people have done so well in life with epilepsy. And therefore, it is nothing to be, uh, uh, there is no stigma which should be attached to it. It is actually not a disease. It is something where the brain uh, has uh, uncontrolled activity at certain points of time. Next, please. So what happens during a, a fits or an epileptic attack? If the above is the normal neural activity, which the nerve, body, and cell firing at that time, during the abnormal, during a seizure activity, it would be firing almost 10, 20 times more. It is like the brain running a mile in five seconds. That's how much metabolically fast and active it would be. And therefore, that would mean that it exhausts all the reserves which are there for other parts of the brain or parts of the brain around it. So it, it absorbs, it takes in all the other nutrients and things like that at that point of time. Next, please. So the type of fits can happen depending on where it starts. So you can have a type of fits happening when, when you know, you can have it starting from the front part of the brain, you can have from the back part of the brain, but the type of fits which it happens uh, happens depending on where it starts. The normal generalized seizure, we know patient falls unconscious. There may be a frothing in the mouth. There may be a, a movement like this of the hands and legs. Sometimes this is not seen. Sometimes the patient just has a vacant stare. Uh, they drop something. But all this depends on where it starts. And we have the next slide. What is done, therefore, for a patient with epilepsy or fits is that you have an EEG done, which is an electrocorticogram, uh, uh, encephalogram, where uh, you record the electrical activity of the brain. Now, the electrical activity of the brain is very similar to the ECG of the heart, where you have wires attached to the, to the scalp, uh, the skin of the skull, and then you get all these recordings which then show you the normal or abnormal electrical activity. Next, please. Now, the treatment of epilepsy we know is mainly by medicines. You can use one or two. There are many, many new medicines which are there. But however, one must understand that nearly one third of newly diagnosed patients with fits will on long term have poor control. And if they have poor control with medicine or if in the scan, or MRI, you see structural abnormalities, then a surgery is needed. Next, please. Now, how do these medications and all these other uh, ways work? Basically, these work by creating the ins insulation of the wire. We Remember, I told you that uh, epilepsy is basically the electrical short-circuiting because there is no insulation. So, I'm not going into the technical details of this, but this is basically the, the medications and other things. We, it works by modulating the transmission of impulses, basically by creating an insulation so that the impulses travel how and where they should and are not uncontrolled. Next, please. 
So this is an example of a one-year-old child who came to us. The child had a very difficult birth, uh, had, uh, did not cry at birth, had hypoxia, which means it did not breathe at birth. It was on uh, an incubator and in an ICU for some time. At three months, started having fits. Uh, and then that progressed uh, despite being on medication. When the child came to us at one year of age, the child was having at least 30 to 40 attacks a day. The child was on five drugs. And still, this is a video EEG was just done, which shows the attack at the same time, shows us the abnormal discharges in the brain so that we could correlate this and see what could be done for the child. Next, please. So what the MRI showed was that the brain was completely structurally abnormal. There were large water areas in the brain which should not be there. And this was uh, probably uh, leading to a lot of abnormal discharges as well. Next, please. So what we decided in our multidisciplinary team meeting for this child was that the best option, since the child was already on five drugs and was not getting controlled, the best option was a surgery, which was called corpus callosotomy, which basically meant to divide the connection between the two halves of the brain and prevent abnormal impulses from going from one side to the other side. And this we felt would best help the child in controlling the attacks. So that, you know, when, when you cut a bad connection uh, in your electrical wiring, and that is what happens. So you don't have any more short circuiting and the child will be helped. Next, please. So this is an ideal setup, what we have for, for surgery. Uh, this is uh, me operating. This is a large microscope, which is there with which we can magnify and see into the brain. Here, the electrophysiologist sits and we have monitoring, including the electrocorticography which, which, uh, and the EEG. Uh, the anesthetist is here monitoring the child and various aspects of the hemodynamics of the child. The nurses are there. And everybody can see what is happening in the microscope on the television monitors. So this is a typical way a, a, a normal modern operation theater looks like. Next, please. So I'm uh, I'm not going to play much of this video. Uh, 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 there are very delicate vessels you can see here. Uh, can you just fast forward this, please? Yeah. So we go between the two halves of the brain. Uh, go forwards and then we start this is the corpus callosum these are the fibers and you can see there is abnormal activity here in the eeg as we are doing it and go go to the end please and once we finish sectioning of the brain we see that uh, the eeg has become normal without any abnormal activity and this also guides us as to how much we need to divide can we go to the next slide please so when, when we did the EEG before the, op, before the surgery, this was the EEG. You had a full abnormal activities in the brain. And when you did the EEG inside the operation theater at the end of surgery, this was a baseline EEG record with absolutely no epileptic activity, which is for us very, very satisfying because you know that you've done a good job by removing the bad connections and not allowing discharges to go from one side to the other. And even better is the fact that the child has done well in the last nine months in surgery with reduction in the drugs and almost no attacks. Next, please. So it is very important to, to recognize early the, those type of fits or, or attacks, epileptic attacks, which are difficult to control. Because especially in children, as it hampers brain growth and development. And what we often see is that often there is a regression in the, in the child's brain development once the child starts having repeated attacks. And we must stop the attack because this rebuilds neuronal networks and improves cognition in these children. Next, please. The next what is important is a stroke or a brain attack. Next. A stroke happens uh, when there is either a blockage or there is a leakage of blood uh, into the brain. Next, please. So whichever happens, what actually happens ultimately is that blood flow to the end of the brain uh, into the smaller vessels does not happen. And therefore, the brain cells do not get blood supply and nutrition. We already discussed as to what happens when that uh, such an event occurs. Next, please. So we must remember, be fast as the stroke symptoms balance, eye, face, arm, speech, and T is time to call. Next, please. Because 
it is very important that you must reach the hospital in time before brain cells start to die because once you must remember that every second blood flow to the brain is stopped 30000 blood cells die every second and therefore it is very 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 important uh, an ischemic core area where blood flow does not go if you if you can salvage that it comes down to a very very small area next please and the reason why we chase time is because if we reperfuse or get back the blood flow to the brain what is ultimately affected is not so big but if we do not get blood supply back as a large and dominant part of the brain which gets affected and we do not want that next please the same with the traumatic brain injury because when there is trauma the brain is tossed about like a ship in a stormy sea and gets injured very badly next please and actually what happens is that with time the severity of injury rapidly increases and this happens because not only is there a primary damage uh, to the brain but there is also a secondary damage due to multiple reasons including ischemia hypoxia different chemicals getting released and things like that and therefore it is very important to aggressively treat this at a proper place next please so what happens normally this, this is a tightly packed you can see the molecular structure of the brain and blood go and nutrition goes out to the brain cells uh, through the uh, through the blood vessels and through the capillaries into into these cells uh, which then maintain their activity next please but when there is uh, uh, either an injury or there is a stroke whether there is bleeding swelling what happens this activity does not happen and therefore there is a cascading effect of biochemical reactions which potentiate cell death and loss of cell connections and therefore what is this healthy brain with a lot of connections becomes this uh, brain which connections are lost and there is a lot of cell death next please so whatever the insult to the brain mechanisms that cause irreversible injury have in common poor blood supply and oxygen to the brain cells but what is important to remember is that we cannot change the damage that has happened to the brain and nerve cells at the cellular and molecular level next please so for example just like we cannot put a blob of butter together once we cut it similarly we cannot bring this uh, structure back to the previous structure but what we can do is rewiring because of neuroplasticity next please so we need to save a patient from a stroke to spot a stroke and shift a stroke as fast as possible because we need to save as much of the neural connections as possible so that with rehabilitation the patient can functionally improve and this is very very important it is not the patient has had a stroke let's leave him alone but we must save as much of the neural connections as possible because that is in the best interest of the patient next please now i'm going to shift gears a bit and this is the story of a of an american called phineas cage and uh, an event which happened on 13th september 1848 changed the way uh, a lot of neuroscientists looked at the brain and brought out a completely new subdivision of, of neurosurgery and neuromedicine so this man was a foreman in the railroad construction in the us and when they, they at that point of time they used to build railroads they had explosives to 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 you know blast the the earth and the rock and therefore after which they would uh, uh, lay the rails now what happened he was distracted by something and there was a blast which happened and that blast drove this particular iron rod which you're seeing in this gentleman's hand uh, through the cheek and into the brain and out of the head this is a diagrammatic representation of what actually happened he got up in about 5 minutes and was absolutely all right didn't realize what was happening but then what happened consequently was that everybody including especially his doctors his friends his family realized that there was a complete personality change in the person and that was when the thought came about in neuroscience that you could change personality by 
by by stimulating or ablating certain parts of the brain and different parts of the brain which have to do with personality can be modulated or can be rewired to make people be different next please now this was very well brought out in the in the movie classic movie one who flew over the cuckoo's nest which came about quite some time back and this actually showed the birth of functional and psycho neurosurgery uh, this started the psychosurgery actually started with prefrontal leucotomies the diagram of which is shown here but fell into disrepute because uh, uh, people felt a lot of unethical surgery was being done but now it has come a full circle we have functional and psycho neurosurgery here to stay there are a lot of governmental regulations put in place there are a lot of protocols which are uh, which are put in place after which you could do it and with very very good results next please one of the main important areas where we use stimulation of the brain and rewiring in such functional cases is in parkinson and that is well best known and we also use it in abnormal movements uh, of the body which is called dystonia you can also use it in epilepsy certain times you could use it in psychological and psychiatric disorders like obsessive compulsive neurosis manic depression and sometimes even addiction so in this surgery which is called deep brain stimulation electrodes are placed in the deep nuclei of the brain and you stimulate the areas which are not working enough therefore the the nerve cell groups which are not actually working enough you stimulate them so that you you create the work to happen as you would want it if you do not want uh, the positive work to happen you do the negative and vice versa next please so if you look at the deep nuclei of the brain this is a diagram of the deep nuclei of the brain and this colorful diagram uh, which you see in your screen shows the green which is the positive or excitatory uh, stimulations which happen and the red and the inhibitory stimulations which happen so you could stimulate any one of these places depending on what you want to do and where you, what you what is the pathology that you would, would want to address and depending on that you could get a good result that you would want and therefore in effect you are rewiring the entire what we call the basal ganglia system next please so this is a can you play the video please this is a typical feature of a parkinson patient where the the patient does not swing his arm uh, the the short shuffling steps there is a difficulty in turning around occasionally they lose balance and this is the typical way uh, they they walk next please so these are typical uh, patient next uh, next please so this is a typical patient where we do deep brain stimulation we put a frame on the head of the patient take an mri so that we accurately localize where we want to reach uh, with our electrodes next please we then use a system of recording with micro electrodes which are placed in the brain temporary micro electrodes we we get recordings from the micro electrodes and each part of these deep parts of the brain have their own signals and therefore we are able to record these uh, uh, signals and we reach exactly where we want to be on both parts this surgery is done under uh, local anesthesia most of the time therefore we are able to see the effect of the stimulation on the patient and we also ensure therefore that we are not harming the patient after that we then again take an mri to make sure that we have reached where we actually want to reach structurally next please so in effect what happens is that this is how the patient was before the surgery and can you play the second video please and this is how the patient walked the day after surgery you can see it's a near normal walk with the proper arm swing a proper gait and there is no problem in turning and this is the beauty of this surgery uh, that you get almost immediate effects and uh, and the best part actually is that this is reversible so if you have a problem during surgery or post surgery you could always also remove the electrodes and uh, the effects are reversed next please you also can do a similar rewiring in spinal cord injury uh urosepsis and urinary retention are a major cause of disability and death in these patients next please and what we can do now are put in stimulation electrodes at the nerves uh, which stimulate the bladder and the bladder control and this therefore helps 
in patient having bladder control, not needing urinary catheters lifelong. Next, please. Neural tube defects are very similar in that uh, these are defects of formation of the spinal cord, mainly sometimes of the brain also, but mainly of the spinal cord. And you have patients who end up, children who end up like adults like this, who are completely paralyzed based down with no control of bowel or bladder. So this young man who is not able to sit up without the support of his hands is on a diaper the whole time and has no use of his legs. So this is a miserable life uh, for many of these patients. And the question they often ask is, why did you save me, doctor? Next, please. It is very important, therefore, to understand that this is because of an abnormal formation of the spinal cord and nerves. Next. And this in embryology, and uh, sorry, but the incidence of this in India ranges to 0.5 to 11%, uh, 11 per 1,000 live births, with some states having a higher prevalence compared to other states. Next, please. Now, the normal development of, of the spinal cord happens by the 28th day. Next, please. And therefore, this abnormality which we see is formed already by the time a pregnancy is confirmed, which means by the time a woman knows that she is pregnant, the abnormality, if it is there, is already formed. And therefore, it's nothing you can do after that. Next, please. This is not just one abnormality, but has a spectrum of disorders of varying degrees of severity. Next, please. And it's also associated with a large number of problems, including uh, hydrocephalus, which is water in the brain, tethered cord, limb abnormality, skin ulceration, uh, scoliosis or, or curved spine, uh, bladder problems, learning disabilities, ADHD, obesity, and the list goes on. Next, please. You have multiple symptoms and signs which show that a, a child has this problem. Next, please. Which may be orthopedic as well. It may be just skin uh, defects. And you can even have just non-healing ulcers in children. Next, please. So, next, please. So, what we do uh, in this is surgery basically to de-tether viable nerves. The, the viable nerves which are caught up in this abnormal formation have to be released. And this is very, very important because we need to prevent the further development of bladder problems. And these will allow for rehabilitation. Now, this is very, very important. The time that you have to intervene is at the earliest. Next, please. You do not wait. We often operate on these children almost as soon as they are born. And that is very important. There is no question of waiting to operate on these children. Next, please. Because, and the most important, I think, is prevention. Avoid consanguineous marriage, genetic screening, and most important of all, folic acid for all women of childbearing age. And this is such a simple thing, which is done in many countries where they have brought down the prevalence and incidence of this very, very problematic situation. Next, please. So when you have this problem, what, what do you do? So now currently technology has allowed us to do fetal neurosurgery, where we are now seeing, next please, that if you operate on children when they are in the uterus itself, you can prevent many, many of the postnatal problems that many of these children develop. And therefore, the children grow up in a much better and with much less number of problems that otherwise the children's would have. Next, please. Next. And therefore, we now know that these children can be helped if it is detected early enough in the mother's womb. And then we can operate on these children and help prevent problems. I will talk a bit on aging in the brain because this is uh, of interest to many people. Next, please. We all age and so does our brain. And the, the MRI scan on top shows us a normal adult brain, while the MRI scan below shows us a brain of a slightly elderly person. Now, if you look at it, there is a loss of, of, uh, of content in the brain. And this happens because in the aged, there is a loss not only of, of neurons, which are nerve cells, but also of connections. Next, please. 
Now, therefore, one gets age-related problems. And these are common, which I've listed, are common age-related memory problems. And these are not dementia. These are uh, things which happen to everybody. Next, please. But, next, please. If you have any of these signs, or if anybody has these signs, these are indications of dementia. Inability to solve problems, feeling confused, inability to engage in conversation, poor judgment, making change in personality. All these are signs of dementia and need to be tackled with forthwith. Next, please. The most important thing is to prevent dementia. The prevention of aging of the brain is very, very important. The concept of retirement is something which I'm very much against. Yes, you may retire from the job that you are doing now, but you cannot retire from life. Because if you retire from life, you are sure to age in your brain and you will get the signs of dementia. So you reduce the risk of dementia by avoiding smoking, avoiding alcohol, developing healthy habits. And there are the six pillars of dementia prevention, which are regular exercise, social engagement, healthy diet, mental stimulation, quality sleep, and stress management. How these help are by improving neural plasticity. Because as you keep your brain active, connections are made. Next, please. So the more you do new things, the more you stimulate your brain, the more you learn a new skill, the more you relax, the more you can do yoga, you can do gardening. All these create new connections regrow and re-establish old connections and this is how you would rewire your brain and keep what connection that you already have intact you don't want to lose those connections and therefore you need to put in that work to keep those connections intact and not only that grow new ones as well next please and in this neuro rehabilitation plays a major role whether it's a head injury whether it's a, a stroke Movement of the limbs is not just for the joints and the muscles because every time you move your limbs, signals go up to the brain to show the brain that yes, they are moving. And when that happens, you have formation of, of sprouting of axons, you have new connections being built. And therefore, this is very, very much targeted uh, uh, neural plasticity or targeted uh, neural networking. Next, please. So rehabilitation helps make a person become functionally better. Next, please. Next, please. So if this particular particular patient who have a, had a devastating brain injury was in the ICU for a long time, then went into aggressive rehabilitation. Next, please. Next, please. And then you can see him this is almost nine months later. He was thought to be non-salvageable. And here he is doing his own work, cleaning his own cot. And this is what rewiring of the brain actually is. Where you can get, you can salvage what is even thought to be non-salvageable initially. And this is what is possible nowadays. Next, please. You can reroute connections in the brain. You can create sprouting of new connections where old connections are lost. And this is what rewiring is done. Rewiring is done by people uh, trying to do new things, keep repeating and doing new things, just like how children grow their knowledge. Similarly, we too can rewire our brains by learning new things, learning new skills, and make doing activities which will help us move the function from an area which is non-functional to an area of the brain which is functional. Next, please. So you can sprout and rewire the brain. Next, please. Therefore, rewiring the brain and the nervous system is possible. However, we need to make an effort to address problems aggressively to do this. Technological advances have made us understand that brain plasticity and new learning can happen all through our lives. Never say never. Never say you're too old to learn something new. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, thank again, Divigyan Prasar, and I'm now open to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, is there any 
uh, we can another session is open for uh, discussion and question answers so kindly uh, directly you can ask the question so kindly ask a question to the speaker uh, pooja can you please coordinate the question answer session But all the participants are requested if you have any questions you can paste it in the chat you can type it in the chat box or you can raise your hand by the time so there is one question on the facebook uh, the person wants to know about the parkinson disease that what is parkinson disease what can we do to avoid it okay parkinson disease is basically it's a problem where there is a uh, uh, imbalance between chemicals in the deep part of the brain uh, so this is what is part it causes uh, tremors it causes stiffness of the body slowness of the body and the mind so this is because of imbalance of chemicals uh, mainly due to a depletion of what is called dopamine in the in the deep parts of this brain and uh, very often uh, this can be either caused by aging it sometimes is genetic uh, sometimes it can happen due to small strokes or brain attacks which affect that area of the brain therefore there are many reasons why this happens and uh, healthy life staying mentally and physically active uh, keeping your blood pressure diabetes under control and a healthy life avoiding smoking and alcohol are the best ways to avoid this in case you do get parkinson the best thing is to treat to see a specialist as early as possible and there are a lot of medications that can be given for parkinson but if these medications do not work or they are you are resistant uh, as i mentioned deep brain stimulation is a wonderful surgery which can be done for this thank you so much sir uh, we have a question um, from one of our speak uh, for one of our participants from other social media handles it is like there is a common myth that uh, the epilepsy gets cured it by itself after the marriage and all so uh, would you please like to uh, throw light on this i wish it was so simple i wish it was so simple unless the spouse has an extreme calming effect on the brain uh this is not going to happen and it is a myth so epilepsy like i said is because of abnormal and uncontrolled discharges in the brain and that has to be tackled by medication i know there are a lot of uh, uh ancient thoughts on uh, and myths on how these can be uh, uh tackled in different parts of the country there are in the villages they do different things uh they sometimes think that the demon has got into you sometimes they think that giving an iron key in your hand works uh but none of these do the patient continues to have attacks and what is needed is proper management of the attacks by medication and if there is a structural problem by surgery there is no other way that it's going to stop thank you so much. is it, sorry, is epileptic fatal anyone can die with this uh, disease epileptic attack yes uh, 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 epileptic attack can be fatal the reason being during the epileptic attack the person does not have control on him or herself so one of the most common causes of death is by aspiration by choking on the froth that happens in the mouth and that is why one of the most important things to do when you see a person having an epileptic attack is turn the person to one side ensure that there is no sharp or object around them where they can hurt themselves and uh, and loosen their clothing do not try to pour water into their mouth or soda into their mouth which is very often done uh, you know on the road side this should not be done all that you need to do is turn the person to one side so that there is any secretions in the mouth it will all come out so that is what has to be done the second cause of death in epilepsy is when a person develops what is called status epilepticus which means that the epileptic attack does not stop but the fits keep going on and on and on and on 
When that happens, you can imagine there are two things which happen. One is I told you that the brain gets exhausted because the brain is running at super speed. The second is there is so much physical activity, muscle contraction going on that there is a lot of bad chemicals which enter the bloodstream. And that itself can cause a problem and can, uh, in certain situations, if not treated, uh, can cause death. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. I have one question related to this. How long a person should continue taking medicines and medication uh, if a person has... And and suppose the epileptic, uh, this uh, fever are not happening very frequently, uh, but how long should the person be on... Okay. The so, the, in general standards, previously, uh, the, the protocol was that once you have at least two attacks, the medications are started. And the patient must continue to take the attacks for at least five years of having no seizure. That means in those five years, the patient should not have an attack and then you can gradually taper and stop the attack. Recent guidelines have said that three years are enough. Uh, so this is the difference. But if you get an attack again, then you must start taking it again. So about 70% of epileptic patients may, after three or five years, be able to reduce and stop their attacks, not on their own, but under medical supervision. The other 30 to 40% will need to continue their medications, sometimes lifelong, because they need the medications uh, to keep them free of attacks. Thank you, sir. Another question in the chat uh, by Mr. Abhinav Singh. He wants to ask him, is it possible to rewire the connections of brain by using the magnets, that is by creating charges in the neurons instead of surgery? Are there any research in it? There is a lot of research going on on using different types of gadgets and technology to do this rewiring. Now, rewiring is not only by surgery. Like I said, rehabilitation itself, whether you do physiotherapy, cognitive retraining, or, uh, you know, all this help in uh, rewiring of the brain. Uh, magnetotherapy has been tried for many, many years, even in India, uh, right, right back in, in 1980s and 90s. There was a lot of, of magnetotherapy which were used. Uh, even now, there are uh, area, there are certain people who do magnetotherapy. So, but uh, the thing is, uh, mag these magnetic therapy has not found to be given a consistent uh, result. There's not a reproducible result which is seen, but it is one of the uh, uh, one of the things in the armamentarium that you could use if there is no harm in using. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is uh, from Ms. Manisha. Manisha, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Sir, I want to ask this. Is there any connection between hypothyroidism and dementia or other brain disease? Sorry, sorry, between hypothyroidism. Uh, yes, sir. And hypothyroidism and dementia. Uh, there is no direct correlation between hypothyroidism and dementia. Okay? okay. But if the person is, is, is badly hypothyroid, and is inactive and does not utilize their brain and does not do any activity of the brain, definitely then they will get it. It's not a direct correlation, but only an indirect correlation. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is from Mr. Pranesh M. How to differentiate a migraine and tension headache? <laughs> that is by clinical, uh, by listening to us. That's it. Okay, it is the sure, clinical sir. story of the migraine or clinical story of the tension headache. That's how you have to do it. Next question is from Mr. Anshuman Gupta. Sir, Anshuman sir is there with us. Uh, sir, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, sir, thank you very much for a very uh, enriching uh, uh, lecture. I just want to ask because aging is a natural phenomenon. Uh, which is the most active age uh, of the mind because I just wrote, I just basically uh, read in one article uh, 
uh, this is the after the age of 60, I think uh, uh, it's supposed to be the most active age in terms of creativity of the mind, so which as per your, uh, what is your take on it? What is the, which is the most active age of the mind? Uh, very frankly, uh, I'm not sure. If you, if you look at a one-year-old child, or a one and a half year old child, they want to touch everything. They want to feel everything. They want to put everything into their mouth. They are curious about everything. So their brain is constantly inquiring and active. Uh, at the age of 60, like you say, you already have in your brain a large amount of data which is already gathered there. But at the age of 60, Unless you yourself start inquiring, looking, and learning, uh, that is going to be of no use and your brain is going to be inactive. So the thing is, I differ a little bit in saying that that's the most active part of the brain. Perhaps it has the capability of being the most active and creative because you have so much data within it. But where it is naturally active and inquiring, I think, is in children. That's when the brain is actually developing its connections. And it's a natural thing for the child to go exploring. You will keep seeing children. They, they keep wanting to do this and that and looking and seeing and asking, why not this? Why not that? Sometimes it is so difficult to answer them as to why. But that is, I think, how the brain develops it its connections but at the age of 60 unless the person wants to do something active they will not do it and therefore it will not be active but the capability of doing it is there thank you sir thank you very much thank you so very much sir uh, now the next question is from sumita ma'am uh, ma'am wants to know that is behavioral modi modification possible with treatment yes it is very very much um, I did not touch on that. I only touched on dementia part of it, but I just also just spoke on OCD and manic depression. Similarly, behavior can be done. Behavior, behavior changes are something that we see very often, both in, in children, in, in challenged children, especially in autism spectrum, uh, as well as post uh, head injury, post stroke, uh, and many of these patients. Now, you can change uh, that it, it is it takes a lot of work, but it is possible to change. And there are a lot of studies, and we have also in our own clinical practice seen many patients where, with a lot of work, patients' behavior has changed. Uh, we, of course, have not been able to do the sort of imaging and electron microscopic and other uh, high end uh, technological uh, uh, things to show the sprouting of images but uh, but i think what we see with with all aggressive uh, 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 training so basically what we do is what we called cognitive retraining and that is when you 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 target certain behavior issues and you give them certain exercises for the brain uh, sit and keep asking them to do the same thing again and again so repetition is one way to ensure new connections and sprouting of new connections. And that is what will, will start doing things. Uh, so yes, so behavior can be modulated uh, uh, both by uh, either cognitive retraining, by psychotherapy, uh, and these sort of things uh, can also, one of the modulations is by medication, uh, which, which deals with the chemicals in the brain. That's how they also do it most often and very rarely now by surgery as well. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is from Mr. Subodh Kumar. He's there with us. Yeah. So thank you so much for the enlightening session, sir. Uh, my question is, is rewiring of autism, ADSD and learning disability possible? Yes, this is what I just said. Um, so if you look at rewiring, all that I'm saying is you redo, try and redo connections. You can't get a new brain. So you have to work with what you have. Okay. So uh, what you do is try to get the best out of it. 
And that is why it is important in all these uh, children. I mean, what you have mentioned is a spectrum uh, of, of children where you have to start working on them early uh, and so that you can modulate. I, I, I mean, I'm using the word modulate instead of rewire because I think that, that describes what you do. Basically, ultimately, inside the brain, it is connections which you change. But I think what you do is modulate their, uh, uh, I won't say abnormal, their activity type. Uh, and therefore, and with the help of medications as well, which, which change the chemicals which cause this problem, you, you can alter behavior to a large type. For example, let me tell you, we had a child uh, with, with uncontrolled epilepsy uh, uh, and he actually went into an autistic behavior mode uh, because of the seizures. After, after three years of uncontrolled seizure, he was fairly in the autistic spectrum when he came to us. But once we had his uh, epilepsy controlled, he gradually over the next six months with a lot of therapy and things like that, he has come back and is now, when he comes into my room, he shows me the new toys that he bought, his new comic book. You know, he's, he's actually socially active. So I think uh, it is possible to do this, but it takes a lot of work. It, it requires the uh, motivation on the top parts of the parents as well uh, to, to, to engage in this uh, and understand what we are trying to do. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is from Ms. Shruti. Uh, she is there on YouTube. That is uh, rewiring helps in uh, depression also. Yes. See, at the end of the day, all psychological and psychiatric disorders have to do with the brain. Uh, I mean, I, people say I love you and point to the heart, but the, the emotion of love is actually in the brain. Uh, it is not in your heart. Uh, so you, there's no point doing this and saying I love you because uh, you need to show some sign of the brain, I suppose. So actually, uh, depression can be managed uh, by rewiring. But when I say rewiring, the rewiring happens not physically. It, it is a rewiring which happens with drugs, with, with the counseling, with psychological retraining, with all this, with, with, with mindfulness activities, it, it takes a, lot, a huge gamut of, of things to be done to create that rewiring. Of course, now for manic depression, we can do the DBS surgery, but that is only in select circumstances when all this does not help. Thanks a lot, sir. The next question is from again from Mr. Abhinav. Uh, he wants to know that is it possible to preserve a brain in laboratory? And if yes, how, uh, for how long? Oh, you can put it in formalin and preserve it for however long. Thank you so much. Not, not functionally. Not functionally, obviously. Not functionally. So the next question is from Mr. Amit Kumar, Dr. Amit Kumar. Sir, if you are there, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much, sir, for this very enlightening lecture. I just wanted to know, uh, uh, is this uh, watching and playing online games by kids negatively affect the brain development in any way? Sorry, sorry. I, 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 didn't, I couldn't hear you properly. Say that again. Uh, is watching uh, games and playing games by kids and mobiles it negatively affect the brain development? Uh, and... Okay. Uh, many parents won't like what I say, but uh, actually when you play games, you're using your brain and motor function activities and improving your hand motor activity coordination actually very well. So it is not going to make you dull however you may not do scholastically very well because you won't do your homework uh, so but i don't think it is going to affect your uh, brain performance as such however having said that doing the same activity over and over again is not going to help you in the long run because what you need to do is keep learning new things. And that is what is going to help a child. So 
that is why it is important for children not to keep playing the same video game teach them new video games uh, I, I, that i think is helpful because that will help them think new and and that is what is important uh, yeah but they also need to do their homework and go to class thank you so much dr amit kumar sir and thank you so much sir the next question is again from mr abhinav uh, he can ask uh, sir is it possible to do a brain transplant uh, what i mean to say is a preserved brain can be implanted in somebody okay so uh, i i didn't talk about that that's another talk altogether uh, brain transplant has been tried actually what they did was they tried to do a it when some people called it a body transplant some people called it a brain transplant in our own mythology we have got uh, lord ganesha who's perhaps the first head and brain transplant done uh, but uh, a lot of research has gone into that now the basic issue is you can connect the blood vessels see in all of the transplants is easy you just put the organ and you connect all the blood vessels and and starts functioning but here you've got something called the spinal cord and if you want to uh, uh, do just a brain transplant you need to cut the spinal cord and then reconnect rejoin the spinal cord which is till date not possible that we have learned with our experience in spinal cord injury patients so till date it's not possible however there has been one uh, uh, publication which has come out where i think they did a a brain transplant in china uh, with an italian surgeon uh, the patient survived for i think 36 hours uh, but uh, that's it uh, so can we do a brain transplant as of today technically technically possible but functionally not possible but who knows maybe in the future it may be possible Uh, so sir uh, as of now there is no much use of preserving someone's brain in a laboratory no unless you want to study electron microscopy or something like that okay thank you thank you sir thank you for answering all the questions very patiently now i over to kinkini ma'am ma'am am i audible Uh, uh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, today's talk has surely advanced the public awareness about the critical research going on, uh, revealing the brain's deepest mysteries and helping to conquer the most feared neurological diseases uh, through neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change and adapt. I think, sir, each of these topics, epilepsy, stroke, Park Parkinson's disease, need separate discussion and understanding. Sure. And, uh, yeah, and I, on behalf of Vigyan Prasad, and on my own behalf, I thank Dr. Shridhar. Thank you, sir, and express my sincere gratitude to you for joining us and enlightening us uh, with the possibilities of neuroplasticity in treating the dreadful brain diseases. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, place on record our hearty thanks to Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General uh, Research and Information System for Developing Countries. RIS and Dr. Amit Kumar from RIS, who is present here, for their enormous cooperation and ideation in this organize in organizing this event. Uh, my special thanks to all the participants and attendees, without whom this session holds no value. Finally, I extend my thanks to our director, Dr. Nakul Parashar, for his support and for motivating us throughout. I also acknowledge uh, the efforts put up by the entire team of ISTI portal for the perfect logistic support, especially to Pooja, Dr. Nidhi, Tusha, and Abhinav. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time and enlightening us uh, with this information. I think it requires a lot of public awareness and education on the, in this area of uh, sciences, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.